Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mareike, for the introduction. Um, it has been a very great pleasure to be here, an absolute pleasure. And um, I've really enjoyed those six months here. And um, so since this is my last lecture, I packed in everything that I promised, right? And um, I don't know how much I will get through. And I also took into account some of the emails that were sent to me requesting uh, specific topics. All right. Uh, so uh, one request that was made had to do with talk about nanostructures. And we already started with that in the last lecture. So what are the optical properties of nanostructures? And I will continue with this today. And then the second request had to do with um, uh, defects such as titanium in sapphire. So I will have a few um, uh, slides about defects. And then finally, at the very end, uh, one of the topics that I'm very interested in, which is stress and strain. If you have a nanostructure, then these nanostructures are often strained, and that changes their optical properties. And how can we describe this? And uh, what are the examples for that? Uh, this <coughs> uh, these lectures are covering uh, three chapters in the book by Mark Fox. And also, I have uh, some applications uh, about defects from uh, you and Cardona's book on semiconductors. So I showed you this slide um, in the last lecture. Uh, about um, how are um, quantum structures, how, how are nanostructures different from uh, the uh, bulk, and how are their properties different. And if you remember, we calculated the um, optical absorption of a bulk material uh, by solving Fermi's golden rule, and there was a matrix term, a matrix element term, and a density of states term. And then we integrated this uh, density of states in three dimensions. And then we're getting this square root-like onset of the absorption coefficient um, at the band gap. And that has to do with um, this three-dimensional uh, integration over to get the joint density of states. So now if we're going from a bulk material to a quantum well, so a quantum well is infinite in two dimensions and had a finite thickness in the third dimension, then you see the first thing that happens is that uh, the band gap shifts. The band gap increases relative to the bulk. And that is known as the confinement shift. And um, a little bit later, I will show you quantitative uh, ways of calculating this confinement shift. But for now, we'll just say there is a confinement shift. And then this square root-like onset in three dimensions becomes a constant in two dimensions. So the exponent here is related to the dimensionality of the uh, nanostructure. So e to the power of 0 becomes a constant. And we have the first. Uh, we have the ground state here, and then there's a constant absorption, and then the first excited state and the second excited state. So we get this staircase-like um, absorption coefficient in quantum wells. So if we reduce the dimensions even further, then we're getting to a quantum wire. And in a quantum wire, the density of states is like this 1 over the square root. And if we are reducing the dimensionality to a zero dimensional structure, which we call a quantum dot, then we get discrete energies, which can be described as a series of delta functions. So this is how the dimensionality of our nanostructure is related to the density of states. And that influences uh, many of the properties of quantum structures. So here. A quantum well is, a, is, two, is infinite in two dimensions, and it has a finite width. And a typical quantum well width might be something like 10 nanometers or 100 angstroms. But we could also think, well, what if we decrease the width of that quantum well to the absolute limit, 
that we only have one atomic layer of a material. So this is often known as uh, two-dimensional semiconductors and uh, we uh, one the most the oldest and most uh, uh, the, the most prolific uh, two-dimensional material that people have worked on is graphene and um, where you have a single layer of carbon atoms uh, and in the plane you have benzene rings uh, so that a single sheet of carbon atoms that is called graphene graphene is interesting because you have this linear crossing of the band structure so it looks like a cone it's also called a Dirac cone because here at this point the um, speed of the electron becomes relativistic and um, at least under uh, certain approximations and that's why a lot of research has been invested into um, graphene uh, this is another example which is becoming more popular nowadays that uh, research on graphene has uh, maybe slowed down a bit and uh, the example here is molybdenum disulfide uh, th there's a whole bunch of these materials they all consist of a metal like molybdenum or tungsten bound to two sulfur or selenium or tellurium atoms these materials are called um, dical dicalcogenides uh, so transition metal dicalcogenides a calcogens are the elements in the sixth column of the periodic table so sulfur, selenium, tellurium these um, uh, elements are known as calcogens so uh, a transition metal dicalcogenides like molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum diselenide um, have received a lot of attention and uh, this is a hexagonal boronitride which is in the same class and also uh, phosphorus can be such a two-dimensional material so this is different from a quantum well because we only have a single monolayer a single layer of a material on a, on a substrate so what's so special about um, graphene so let's start with the benzene molecule uh, we have this uh, six-membered uh, ring which is terminated with uh, hydrogen atoms so that is known uh, as uh, graphene in this picture they're single and double bonds but of course that picture is misleading because the electrons are really delocalized uh, in this plane and um, one can extend uh, this uh, single benzene molecule in uh, two dimensions and then by replacing all these uh, hydrogen bonds at the uh, around the ring with with other rings so there's another ring here another ring here etc so then we have this uh, graphene sheet and um, in a three-dimensional structure we would call that graphite that we have uh, very strong bonds in the graphene plane but only weak van der Waals bonds between the planes so that would be graphite and therefore if you take a piece of scotch tape and apply to a piece of graphene then one or more of I'm sorry if you take a piece of scotch tape and apply to graphite then one or more of these uh, graphene sheets can be removed and then they stick on the scotch tape and then you can put that tape down on uh, a foreign surface for example a metal and then you can study the properties of this uh, uh, sheet of graphene that you have removed and there was a Nobel Prize about this um, maybe 10 years ago <coughs> and if we look at the band structure the two-dimensional band structure of this graphene then we see here we have this linear crossing and that uh, has caused a lot of attention and many of the properties of this graphene sheet are due to this linear Dirac crossing uh, graphene is not the only carbon nanostructure that we can form there's also uh, 
we can make these sort of footballs that consist all of graphene, so this is carbon-60, there are other types of uh, these uh, spherical nanostructures like there's a carbon-70 and there's some other magic numbers. Uh, you find such uh, so-called buckyballs or fullerenes, uh, you find them in soot or uh, they have been around for a very long time but you really need a very good microscope uh, in order to uh, study these and to isolate them. So uh, that's one form of carbon nanostructure and then what we can also do is we can start with a graphene sheet and then we sort of roll it up and then we get this tube and um, this is called a uh, carbon, nan uh, uh, this is called a uh, carbon uh, nanotube and uh, these carbon nanotubes have been studied ex extensively and there is a book by Millie Dresselhaus which uh, describes these, uh, the prop the optical properties of these uh, nanotubes and uh, especially there have been uh, many Raman studies and uh, photoluminescence studies and then the question is how do we um, uh, classify these, uh, these materials and, and how do we modify the properties of these materials uh, by doping with uh, defect atoms. Um, how exactly we roll, whether we roll it or whether we roll and shift uh, can be classified by two numbers and one of them is the uh, number of atoms that you count as you go around the nanotube and another one is how you shift the sheet uh, as you roll it up and uh, this is characterized by these two numbers N and M and there are so called armchair nanotubes where you go around in this uh, pattern which looks like uh, an old-fashioned armchair or you can go around uh, in a, a zigzag nanotube and um, so th there, are, there are ways how we can use group theory to classify the patterns uh, that are generated by rolling up these nanotubes and uh, so this needs to be uh, classified and then depending on how these carbon nanotubes are rolled up uh, they can have very different properties and uh, some nanotubes are uh, semiconducting and others are metallic and um, if you have a semiconducting nanotube then it will have a band gap and as one might expect the band gap of this nanotube goes up as the diameter of the tube is shrinking and we see that for example in uh, photoluminescence uh, here we have many many different uh, types of uh, carbon nanotubes and because it is an ensemble with different uh, sizes and, and different types uh, we see all kinds of peaks in this photoluminescence signal but then there are ways that the chemists can separate these carbon nanotubes into only one species and if you have only one species then uh, you get uh, very sharp uh, very sharp peaks that are very characteristic of the type of the nanotubes. Uh, nanotubes are important um, technologically because they are used as um, displays for flat panel displays so here you see you have a, a cathode and you have a transparent anode and in between you have this electroluminescent layer uh, and uh, um, um, here you have this electroluminescent layer and by applying a voltage uh, you can get light out uh, very efficiently of these uh, carbon nanotubes and um, applying such a thin layer of a carbon nanotube on a sheet of glass or even on a sheet of plastic is very inexpensive and that's why prices have dropped uh, for these uh, large flat panel displays because they're much uh, cheaper to fabricate than um, 
cathode ray tube uh, televisions in the past. So getting back to these um, two-dimensional semiconductors, especially the transition metal dichalcogenides, I already told you how the uh, carbon nano, uh, how uh, graphene is fabricated and it started with um, just taking graphite and ripping off a sheet of graphene with some scotch tape. Uh, nowadays there are other ways to produce uh, graphene, for example, uh, by, uh, by thermal treatment of a silicon carbide uh, substrate, you can form a graphene sheet. But on the next slide, I wanted to show you how one can make these uh, tr uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. So, um, you ha if, you, if you work in a, in a quartz tube, then you have your substrate over here, and you have a calcogen powder, and you have a metal powder. And if you heat up these powders, then um, the vapor pressure of these elements will increase to a point where these um, metals and uh, where these metals and the calcogens can be dissolved in a carrier gas, and then the carrier gas carries these uh, precursor sources uh, over the substrate, and here you can uh, deposit these. Uh, thin layers of transition metal like alcogenides. Uh, typically you get these flakes and it is very difficult to make only one layer as you might imagine. Uh, but it is possible to make uh, flakes which are on the order of uh, uh, maybe 10 microns and that is large enough to do optical experiments if the uh, laser is focused very tightly onto these uh, thin monolayer flakes. Another way to produce these is with um, chemical vapor deposition and here um, many metal precursors are liquid. <coughs> so you have your metal organic uh, precursor here and the carrier gas goes through this bubbler and um, the dry carrier gas takes some of the liquid precursor with it so you have this misty uh, vapor which contains the uh, metal precursors and then the uh, calcogen precursors are usually gases. Uh, like here there is um, hydrogen sulfide and you mix these uh, precursors and using a shower head you bring down these uh, precursors over the heated substrate and then this is how you can um, produce such uh, thin layers of these um, uh, two-dimensional semiconductors. The third method is a molecular beam epitaxy and I already showed you this probably in the last lecture that you have various effusion cells which contain the um, precursor elements and then you heat up the temperature in the effusion cells and you create an atomic beam which deposits a thin layer on the, on the substrate. So, um, we've talked about how can you produce uh, thin layers, either quantum wells using uh, epitaxy or um, these two-dimensional sheets of materials. And I also wanted to show you how one can produce uh, vertical quantum wires. And there's two ways, either you do it bottom up or you do it top down. Uh, and with this method here, you start with a substrate and then you uh, deposit a uh, little bit of a metal on top of the substrate. And usually one would uh, choose gold in many cases. Gold works very well uh, with germanium, for example. And then as you heat up the uh, substrate, this gold metal will melt and you form a little piece of a droplet of gold on the surface. And then you expose this metallic liquid uh, droplet of gold to a uh, flux of a um, 
precursor, let's say germane, and then the germanium from the precursor will get dissolved in this uh, gold, so this gold can absorb uh, maybe a few percent of germanium, and the germanium will simply be dissolved in that um, metal droplet, but as you increase the uh, as you continue to expose this droplet to a germanium flux the liquid supersaturates, there's too much of the germanium in the droplet and therefore the droplet expels the germanium at the bottom at the substrate interface and by doing that the droplet gets pushed up so you see that here, that this is the original droplet, we're exposing it to a germanium flux, the germanium gets pushed out to the bottom and uh, that is how we can have this quantum wire, this pillar where the germanium droplet sits on the top. Now we can switch by uh, not always using germanium, we can also expose this to uh, other vapors so we can produce uh, different types of materials as we grow here by switching the uh, flux to which the metal droplet is exposed. Of course as this pillar grows we have to worry about not only growth along the uh, vertical axis but we're also getting uh, horizontal growth which means that the diameter of this pillow uh, grows and it's difficult to control the aspect ratio height divided by width but that can be done to some extent by uh, uh, with the growth conditions like temperature or pressure. So these gold droplets uh, that's one way to uh, grow um, quantum wires the other way is that we um, have a substrate and we cover the substrate with a layer like an oxide or a silicon nitride with an insulating layer and then we etch or otherwise damage this layer and we make a hole in the mask layer and which goes all the way down to the substrate. Now as we expose this um, structured surface to a flux of a precursor then if the growth conditions are chosen appropriately then no growth will occur on the silicon nitride or silicon oxide because the growth cannot nucleate here on the masked layer and instead you can only grow here in this little window where the substrate has been exposed and therefore you can grow this uh, pillar, you can grow this quantum wire um, because growth only occurs here in the uh, in this region where the mask has been removed and we have to worry about not only the uh, vertical growth but also the horizontal growth uh, the uh, growth depends on the uh, surface orientation that's why we're getting these um, preferential shapes but uh, these are two ways how we can produce uh, quantum wires. Uh, this is another method which um, a lot of people in Barcelona talked about at the ellipsometry conference uh, that how can we make these uh, slanted um, quantum wires so we start with a surface where there are some imperfections on the surface and then we sputter, that means we expose this surface to a um, flux of uh, metal atoms and then if the flux hits the surface uh, at a certain angle then these imperfections on top of the surface they produce a shadow effect so growth can occur on this side but growth cannot occur here on that side because it is sort of in the shade and uh, not exposed to that flux and as these nanostructures grow this shadow effect becomes uh, stronger and stronger and therefore we're getting these uh, tilted uh, nanowires and um, 
They have very anisotropic optical properties and one needs very complicated uh, models to describe their optical properties because they are uh, optically biaxial and then what one, what one can also do is one can rotate this uh, surface as one produces uh, the growth and if one uh, rotates this surface then instead of getting these slanted wires we, get, we actually get spirals uh, where uh, this goes around in a zigzag and then um, they become, uh, they in these, these spirals interact with uh, circularly polarized light, give us circular polarization. Um, how do we make quantum dots? Uh, the key to getting uh, light out of quantum dots is that we need core shell nanoparticles so the red area is the core of the nanoparticle which uh, produces the light emission and then there is a second material with a similar crystal structure but larger band gap around it so that would be called the shell and uh, chemists can produce these types of um, core shell nanoparticles using chemical methods liquid chemical methods in a beaker so I don't really know uh, how that works so I don't want to get into it but what's interesting is that by changing the size of these nanoparticles uh, using the same material we can cover the entire visible spectrum from red uh, to blue all of that with the same chemistry with the same elements all that's changing is the size of that nanoparticle This is um, a spectrum from such nanoparticles. This is work by uh, Sherry Kagan and her husband Chris Murray. And what you see here is that you have different um, diameters of uh, nanoparticles and these are photoluminescence spectra. And this is the largest diameter and it has the lowest um, energy and as you decrease the diameter of the structure the photon energy moves uh, to higher energies the emission moves to higher energies and this is shown for uh, cadmium selenide and uh, cadmium telluride uh, nanoparticles Another way to produce nanoparticles not in a liquid but on a semiconductor substrate is uh, the stransky krastanov growth of uh, semiconductor islands. So here um, we need to think about how does growth, how does semiconductor growth occur on a surface. Of course what we would like to have is that we start with a substrate and then we grow one layer after the next and we get nice uh, uh, layers on our uh, surface so that would be called uh, layer by layer growth but there is another growth mode which is called island growth mode and um, if the stress becomes very large then it is energetically unfavorable to have these flat layers instead it is better to form relaxed islands. Uh, stransky krastanov growth is a hybrid of these two growth methods where for a few monolayers we for, for the first few monolayers we grow layer by layer and then after these few monolayers have been deposited um, we uh, we grow islands and a typical example for this stransky krastanov growth is a germanium on silicon where um, f three or four monolayers of germanium can be grown layer by layer but then as you increase the germanium thickness um, you are getting islands so strain can mediate the formation of islands and then these islands are typically very small on the order of maybe 10, 20 uh, nanometers so you can produce these quantum dots on the substrate uh, using this stransky krastanov growth mode. Um, if, even if the growth normally occurs uh, by layer by layer you can encourage the growth of islands 
by doing something to the surface. So let's say you start with a gallium arsenide substrate and then you put down a layer of photoresist and then you pattern the resist and remove the resist in certain areas and then you expose this uh, gallium arsenide to a certain type of edge with pref which preferentially edges the 111 uh, uh, planes and um, KOH, potassium hydroxide, is, is a good example of such an anisotropic edge. So then you form these inverted pyramids. These are not grooves, these are inverted pyramids uh, with 111 surfaces. And then if you remove the photoresist and grow on this, then the growth will occur uh, preferentially along the 111 surface. So you can grow these types of um, quantum dots uh, because the growth occurs wherever you have uh, placed defects in the surface of the substrate and then you get these uh, types of ensembles of quantum dots so this is an indium arsenide quantum dot on a gallium arsenide substrate if you do photoluminescence of such a structure then you get very broad peaks because each of these quantum dots is a little bit different and has a slightly different size so therefore you need to uh, use special techniques near field microscopy for example or there may be other ways to uh, focus the laser beam onto a single quantum dot and if you use, if you manage to uh, illuminate either a single quantum dot or a small number of <laughs> quantum dots then you get very sharp peaks so this broadening is not coming from the individual quantum dot the individual quantum dot gives us very sharp peaks but it is the averaging over this ensemble which broadens the far field uh, photoluminescence because here we have about we illuminate about 10, mil, um, 10 million of these uh, quantum dots. So light emission from these quantum dots seems to be uh, very efficient and uh, very highly uh, monochromatic but the problem is how do we illuminate only one quantum dot or how do we make all the quantum dots exactly the same size? Uh, that, is, uh, that is a challenge. So we've talked about um, quantum wells, two-dimensional materials, uh, quantum wires and quantum dots but if we look at these quantum wires for example all of this is one material it's all one material in a metamaterial we have an artificial structure where we combine different materials with, uh, with a feature size which is less than the wavelength. So look at this material here for example, this is sort of a stack. So uh, you can imagine these are bars of wood and you have one layer going uh, up and down and one layer going left and right and then you stack this, you stack this uh, wooden uh, beams and then we, we shrink this and we don't use wood but we use some other material like a semiconductor or a metal and we uh, shrink down the dimensions to a size which is much less than a wavelength and this can be achieved uh, with a variety of methods so then in a metamaterial which has been formed in such a stack the optical properties of this metamaterial are very different from the properties of the material that we started with and um, so on the left is a different type of arrangement uh, we have sheets of paper or plastic and then we have these rings which are uh, patterned on these uh, sheets of plastic and these are called split ring uh, resonators it's, it's not a ring, it doesn't go all the way around but there's a gap in the ring 
and therefore uh, charges can oscillate around this ring and therefore such a structure offers a very strong uh, uh, offers a very strong coupling to the magnetic field in an electromagnetic wave so we're saying typically the mu which shows up in Faraday's law typically the mu is equal to one at uh, optical frequencies however if the frequency is one of the resonance frequencies with which the electrons go around here then even at optical frequencies this mu may not be one and therefore one can form materials where mu is negative and also epsilon is negative and then we're getting these left-handed materials which have a negative refractive index this is not an actual photograph but this is an artist's rendition of what should happen if you have a straw in a water glass then uh, because of refraction uh, you, you get this kind of picture that there's a discontinuity it looks like the straw is broken but actually that's just a refraction effect in a left-handed material uh, the refraction goes the wrong way and um, I'm not an expert on this and I've seen some experts who say no this is absolutely impossible this will never happen no one's ever actually been able to take a photograph like that to prove whether this is true uh, but there's a lot of theoretical work and also experimental work going into these uh, left-handed materials also in a stack like this there are certain frequencies where the light cannot propagate through this and uh, therefore uh, such materials are called uh, are said to have uh, photonic band gaps so I'm not an expert in metamaterials so you will probably have a million questions about this uh, but I'm the wrong person to ask but I just wanted to mention that with an artificial combination of otherwise normal materials we can get some very strange effects which we do not normally find in in bulk materials so at the ellipsometry conference there was a lot of talk about metasurfaces so these uh, m materials here these are three-dimensional even though they are artificial combinations of nano objects so in a meta surface all we do is pattern the surface for example we can have small um, metal dots on an insulating surface and then the same way that these meta materials these three-dimensional meta materials have unusual properties we can get the same unusual properties from uh, meta surfaces and um, these type of meta surfaces have applications for um, especially sensors and antennas so some of the older people in the room may remember that there was a time when you had a radio in your car and there was an antenna sticking out and then once in a while there would be unfriendly hooligans who would just snap that antenna and then you had to spend uh, a large amount of money in order to buy a new one so nowadays we don't have antennas like that anymore because there are more efficient ways uh, to, uh, to uh, receive and transmit uh, radio waves and uh, with such meta surfaces the hope is that we can make even more uh, efficient uh, sensors and antennas how do we model the optical properties of such a material and the first method is that we simply ignore the nanostructure and we somehow describe the material as an average of its properties that approach does not usually work very well because we created these nanostructures so that they would have abnormal properties so a normal description is not going to work 
Nevertheless, if the uh, arrangement is not too crazy, then uh, in some ways it is possible to do some averaging of the uh, two or three materials that we have uh, and, and describe the properties of the object as a uh, using as an effective medium with average uh, optical properties. One way to take this average is you just say look I have three different materials here maybe I have the sticks and I have the uh, holes and then here I have something else which I don't know what it is and then one can simply take the average of the dielectric function. Taking the average of the dielectric function is probably better than taking the average of the refractive index because the average uh, because the dielectric function is more closely related to the electric fields uh, to the electromagnetic fields that we have here. So one can take the uh, average of the uh, dielectric function but there's a better way to do this which is called the Brueggemann effective medium approximation and let's start with this problem first <coughs> if you have a parallel plate capacitor and you put a dielectric sphere So if you put a dielectric sphere into the capacitor then uh, it is possible to solve this problem analytically. So books on electromagnetic theory will have the solution to this. So using this approach uh, one can derive effective medium theories for spherical particles or even for elliptical particles and here we describe the uh, air or whatever it is that this uh, capacitor is filled so the air is the host and the uh, dielectric is the medium that we have placed inside the host and then in other ways this uh, dielectric particle disturbs the host and um, one can write down the uh, solution to this problem and one can describe the uh, one can describe how the dielectric sphere inside the capacitor will change the capacitance and then of course that gives us an effective uh, dielectric constant for this capacitor. Uh, so that is known as Maxwell Garnet uh, effective medium approximation that we have a host like air and we have a guest or a defect medium which is the dielectric. Uh, the, the idea behind the Brueggemann effective medium approximation is then rather distinguishing between the host and between the matrix and the defect we say that everything together everything together is an effective medium and then both the matrix and the defects are uh, perturbations of this effective medium and then one writes down this uh, solution to this problem where uh, F is the volume fraction and epsilon with a subscript is either the epsilon of air or the epsilon of the dielectric and this epsilon here is the um, effective medium dielectric constant that we want to derive and at least for uh, two or three uh, types of media it is possible to solve this equation and that's done numerically in the, in the software so we can calculate an effective medium for something that looks like this by ignoring all the microstructure. Now as I said that usually doesn't work very well at least not if the uh, structure was designed on purpose to, uh, to fail the effective medium approximation. So in such a case what we need to do is we need to go back to Maxwell's equations and we need to uh, write a, a discrete uh, solution to these Maxwell's equations and um, 
then we find a numerical solution uh, to Maxwell's equations on this grid and this method is called uh, rigorous uh, coupled wave approximation and that is used um, in the semiconductor industry to uh, determine the feature sizes of uh, small structures, of small transistor structures and um, this is a Fourier method that means we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, model a single uh, one of these structures but it has to be a periodic structure and um, this is a modern uh, type of transistor which is called a FinFET it's a vertical transistor the source and the drain and the gate they're all aligned uh, vertically and um, uh, in practice the shapes are not as nice but they're more rounded and uh, then we do an ellipsometry experiment we measure how the light gets reflected by such a structure uh, that is called scatterometry and uh, by doing this uh, one can determine uh, various parameters like the um, thickness at the foot, in the middle on, and the top. Uh, these types of equations are very hard to solve and the software is usually proprietary so you don't know uh, how this works but somehow if you uh, put your uh, semiconductor wafer through this uh, scatterometry technique then you get certain parameters out that you are interested in which seem to be uh, aligned with uh, transmission electron microscopy results. Uh, this is another example but now in the back end that you have uh, dielectrics and uh, copper fins going across the dielectric uh, so this is something that uh, might be uh, test structure for a um, back end of the line um, process. Uh, Alan Diebold has published a lot of this and uh, that's why I'm listing this uh, reference here. Uh, this is a review article in applied material, in uh, applied physics letters materials. So I've talked a lot about the different types of quantum structures and um, how they are made and now I want to go back to the physics and I want to describe uh, how do we calculate the confinement energy for a quantum well. Um, in the last lecture I used the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to motivate the physical origin of this confinement energy so in a quantum well we are confined in let's say the z direction but the particle can travel in the x and y directions so the x and y dimensions are infinite and only the z direction is confined and because the uh, z dimension is uh, restricted there is uh, we've confined the particle in the z direction so there has to be an uncertainty in the z component of the momentum and this uncertainty in the momentum gives us an uncertainty in the energy and therefore there has to be a confinement energy so here we are showing the wave function perpendicular in the x and y axis we just have plane waves but in the z direction in a quantum well with infinite barriers um, the wave function must be zero at the um, edges of the quantum well because the uh, wave function cannot penetrate into the barrier because the uh, barrier height is infinite so we need to have nodes here at the barrier and uh, for the ground state we have one node here and one node on the left and one node on the right and then for the excited states the number of nodes will increase more and more so these are the solutions that we get 
for a particle in a box and that solution has been known for a very long time and it's very easy to find that solution uh, analytically. So the energy of a particle will have a kinetic energy along the xy axis. So this is a two-dimensional momentum. On top of that, there will be this confinement energy. And the confinement energy goes like 1 over the thickness squared. And it also goes like n squared, where n, where n minus, where n plus 1 is the number of nodes that we have. So we're getting this uh, sequence of bound states in this uh, particle in a box with infinite barriers. It is important to note that the mass that we need to use here is not the free electron mass but it is the effective mass of the material and uh, one can do more complicated calculations to see what this effective mass actually should be but it's, it's definitely not the free electron mass. And because we have the effective mass here in the denominator, uh, the electrons have a smaller mass than holes and therefore the confinement affects the electrons much more than it affects the holes. In practice, the barriers will not be infinite. In practice, the barriers will be finite and therefore the wave functions can penetrate a little bit into the barrier. And um, in such a case, one needs to solve the um, Schrodinger equation numerically. And um, the confinement energies are smaller than in the um, case with infinite barriers and also the number of um, confined states which is infinite if the barrier height is infinite the number of uh, confined states is uh, limited if we make the quantum well thin enough then there will be no confined states at all um, but uh, you know that, that needs to be solved numerically This is an example of a quantum well. We have gallium arsenide as the quantum well and we have aluminum gallium arsenide as the barrier. So this would be a single quantum well between aluminum gallium arsenide barriers grown on a gallium arsenide substrate and then we have confinement for the holes and confinement for the electrons uh, just like I explained on the previous slide. Now we can continue, we, we can repeat the structure, we can continue growing and we can have a sequence of aluminum gallium arsenide barriers, gallium arsenide well, barrier well, barrier well, etc. Then we're getting a structure that looks like this. So now do we call this a multiple quantum well? Are these individual quantum wells still uh, uh, isolated from each other? Or do we need to call this a super lattice where we need to treat this entire uh, structure as a single three-dimensional structure? And to answer that question, we need to ask whether the wave function from one well penetrates over to the second well. So if the penetration depth of the wave function is much less than the distance between the quantum wells, then we can treat these quantum wells as isolated multiple quantum wells and the physics is the same as we had for a single quantum well. However, if the wave function from this well leaks over into the next well, then, the, then all the wells in this structure are coupled and therefore we uh, call this a super lattice so this would be a super lattice and instead of having single confined states in each of the quantum wells we have these super lattice mini bands uh, both in the conduction band and in the valence band. So a super lattice is another example of a material which is artificially structured uh, with properties that we would not see in a regular bulk material. <coughs> 
So why are we interested in uh, quantum structures? Let's go back to the uh, Fermi's golden rule. The um, recombination rate is a, uh, has two uh, contributions. There is this square of the dipole matrix element and then there is this density of states term. And the density of states term we've already uh, discussed and uh, uh, this goes like uh, a square root and this is constant and here we have one over square root and for a quantum dot we have delta functions. So that is the joint density of states. But what about the matrix element? So first we note that the solutions to this uh, quantum well problem uh, have a certain parity. So relative to the center of the quantum well, this looks like an even solution because it is symmetric around the center of the quantum well. So this is an even solution and this is an odd solution. So if I calculate a matrix element between an odd, between, an even solu between an odd solution and an even solution, then that matrix element uh, will vanish because the two wave functions uh, included in this uh, matrix element have the wrong uh, parity. So therefore we can only make transitions from even states in the valence band to even states in the conduction band and the same for the odd states. But actually if we calculate the matrix elements then we see that uh, the change in this quantum number n must be zero which is even more restrictive than what we just get from uh, parity. So there are selection rules and the other factor that we look into this uh, as we look into this uh, matrix element is that uh, the wave functions are confined and therefore this matrix element is larger for quantum structures than it would be in a three-dimensional uh, bulk material. So the confinement enhances the overlap matrix element, enhances this dipole matrix element and therefore absorption and recombination are more efficient in quantum structures than they are in three-dimensional materials and that's why we are so interested in these. So um, let's look a little bit more closely into the absorption from a quantum well. So here we have a uh, valence band with two confined states and a conduction band with two confined states and um, the confinement energies are indicated here by the dashed lines but then the um, confinement is given, the confinement energy is given by the z-direction of the quantum well and um, in the xy-direction the um, electrons and holes also have kinetic energies so that's why we are getting these bands, uh, these quadratic bands where the uh, x and y components of the momentum are responsible for the quadratic curvature. And then instead of getting this three-dimensional absorption here, um, I'm getting this staircase-like absorption coefficient. I can have a transition from the first hole to the first electron band or from the second hole to the second electron band. So n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3. Well, in this case, there is no 3 because the, uh, we're running out of room here but uh, we're getting this staircase like um, increase in the absorption coefficient. In this picture we are ignoring the excitonic enhancement so at the beginning of each of these uh, steps we're expecting an excitonic peak which sits on top of that uh, staircase structure. <coughs> And that is shown in this uh, actual picture. We see the staircase structure 
But on top of that, we have these sharp peaks. And this is a simplified valence band. In the valence band, we actually have heavy holes and light holes. Therefore, we have a heavy hole exciton and a light hole exciton. So we're, we have this step-like structure and then two peaks for the heavy hole and the light hole. And here is the next step where we have a heavy hole and a light hole. And then that is the third step, again, with a heavy hole and a light hole sitting on peaks uh, about that. And uh, the arrows show forbidden transitions. Uh, the arrows show peaks for uh, forbidden transitions. But in principle, we see this staircase-like um, absorption behavior modified by the excitonic peaks. Absorption coefficient versus photon energy. Um, this is a similar picture, but it compares the uh, absorption for bulk gallium arsenide with that of a quantum well. So in bulk gallium arsenide, without excitonic enhancement, we have this square root-like onset of the absorption coefficient. Uh, if we add excitonic effects, then we're getting this peak and we're getting uh, at large energies above the band gap, we're recovering the square root-like onset. So this bulk behavior of the absorption is very different from the quantum well, where we have this step which is modified by the electrons. So the first thing you see is that this is all at room temperature. In a quantum well, the excitonic effects are much stronger than in bulk gallium arsenide. And that has to do with the confinement effect that in the quantum well, the electron and the hole are more confined and they are uh, closer to each other and the wave functions for the electron and the hole overlap more. So where for the bulk gallium arsenide, the excitonic binding energy is only 4.2 mEV. For a quantum well with 10 nanometer thickness, the excitonic binding energy is 10 mEV just because of that uh, increased uh, overlap. We see there is a splitting between the heavy hole and the light hole. And um, we're expecting some splitting between the confinement energies. This is the confinement energy. This is the effective mass which enters the confinement energy. The heavy hole and the light hole will have different uh, effective masses. And therefore, the um, confinement energies will be different for the heavy hole and the light hole. In practice, what also happens is that there will be a strain splitting which splits the heavy hole and the light hole bands and therefore this splitting may not necessarily be due to confinement, it could also be due to strain. The confinement energies go like 1 over the thickness squared. So in this picture we plot the photoluminescence energy versus the barrier thickness. Here 300 angstrom barrier thickness, 50 angstrom barrier thickness. And we see a strong increase uh, of the um, confinement energy. We see a strong increase in the photoluminescence shift as the um, quantum well thickness becomes smaller and one can fit this. Um, I'm assuming that the dashed line, yeah, so the dashed line is the infinite well approximation from this equation. So we see the dashed line does not work uh, too well. Uh, so the confinement energies are actually less and that comes from the fact that uh, these are quantum wells. I believe these are indium gallium arsenide indium gallium arsenide quantum wells with indium phosphide barriers. So the barrier height is not infinite. The barrier height is approximately only one electron volt. Um, or less. So here is a shift of um, 
Here is the photoluminescence signal from different quantum wells with different thicknesses. That's a very thick one with 2000 angstroms, so that's bulk. And the uh, wavelength decreases or the photon energy increases as the well width uh, goes down from 150 angstroms to 10 angstroms. So that's the confinement shift. Um, in addition to these transitions from the valence band to the conduction band, we can also have inter subband transitions. So, this we call the valence band, and this we call the conduction band. And each of these confined states with the xy kinetic energy added to it each of these states is called a subband. So this would be the first electron subband, this would be the second electron subband. We can also make transitions from one subband to another subband. And here these selection rules are different, and I could explain why that is. Uh, so here delta n needs to be odd. So why is the selection rule like this? So if we make a transition from a valence band to the conduction band. This transition needs to couple to a photon. The photon has odd parity, so it, can own, it needs to be associated with a change in the parity as we compare the ground state and the excited state. The valence band and the conduction band already have different parities because the valence band has an L equal 1 state and the conduction band is an L equal 0 state. So we already have different parities in the valence band and in the conduction band and therefore the transition between the subbands needs, uh, needs to conserve parity. On the other hand, if we do an inter subband transition, then delta n needs to be odd because there's no change in the band parity so to match the odd parity of the photon uh, we can, there needs to be a change in the parity of the wave function as we go from one um, subband to another subband. These inter subband transitions can be used for infrared detectors and lasers. And there is something which is called the quantum cascade laser. And here we have a quantum well, and it has one, two, three. Um, subbands and we have applied an electric field and therefore because of the because the electric field has been applied uh, the energy as a function uh, so this is energy and this is position so um, we get this slope in the energy versus position because of the uh, applied electric field and then if we have, we inject an electron into the uh, third uh, state, into state number three, so that's the second excited state. And from that uh, third excited state, we make a, we emit a photon. The electron makes a transition from state number three to state number two. So this is the transition, a photon is emitted and then through non-radiative recombination the electron jumps from state number two to state number one. We have matched the electric field in such a way that the ground state of this quantum well is aligned with the um, number three excited state in the next quantum well. So the electron which is now sitting here can tunnel through the barrier and will end up in the uh, next excited state number three and there we can emit another photon into number two and so the process here can continue if we have tuned the thicknesses and compositions of all these quantum wells very precisely and if we have chosen the right uh, electric field and if there are no other uh, things that uh, could possibly go wrong. So all of these quantum wells emit a cascade of photons, that's why it's called the quantum cascade laser.
And uh, such lasers can be uh, very efficient as uh, infrared, uh, uh, infra for infrared light emission. So that finishes the first topic that I wanted to talk about, about nanostructures. So now I should probably ask you if you had any questions about nanostructures. So the second topic I was asked to cover was defects. And um, here are uh, some terms that you find in the literature. So a vacancy is uh, just what you might expect that that means. There's just an atom missing from the perfect infinite crystal. So that's a vacancy. An interstitial is an extra atom which does not sit at a crystal site, at a lattice site, or um, does not occupy the same space where a regular atom of the crystal is, but it somehow sits in the middle between two atoms. So that's an interstitial. A substitutional defect is if we remove one atom from the crystal and we replace it at the same site with a different one. That will be a substitutional defect. If uh, we have more than one type of atom then we can switch two atoms. For example if we have gallium arsenide we can switch one gallium with one arsenic atom. Uh, so that will be called a, an, an antisite. And then we, have, we can have more complex defects which are basically um, combinations of these uh, basic defects. For example, we can have a vacancy that's combined with an interstitial. Uh, so that there's, there's all kinds of uh, more complicated defects. But here today I wanted to talk about primarily uh, substitutional defects. Um, such defects can be um, electrically inactive. So if I have a silicon crystal and I add a germanium atom, then silicon and germanium both have 10, uh, I'm sorry, both have four electrons. So this would be an isoelectronic defect. On the other hand, if I put phosphorus or arsenic into silicon, then uh, such a donor is a substitutional defect which adds an electron. And similarly boron uh, would be an acceptor which has one uh, electron too few which only has three electrons so that adds a hole. So this is the electrical classification of the various defects. If we look at a material, we have the valence band and we have the conduction band, then we need to ask what are the energies of these defects relative to the regular band structure. Uh, some defects have energies that are very close to the uh, conduction band or close to the valence band and such defects are called uh, shallow donors. And um, other defects are deeper in the band and they are called uh, deep centers or uh, deep defects. Um, shallow donors are typically ionized at room temperature or shallow acceptors. Uh, that means that the energy, the, the energy of this defect is less than kT at room temperature and therefore they're ionized and the electron that this donor uh, contributes to the crystal can participate in electronic transport. So uh, shallow defects are usually beneficial but deep defects usually uh, act as traps and contribute to non-radiative decombination so they are typically undesirable. When we talk about defects then uh, 
there are a few things that are different from what we have uh, discussed so far for perfect crystals and therefore um, I want to remind us about the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and the frank condon principle which show up in uh, molecular physics and atomic physics. So if I have a molecule then that molecule will have a certain bond length R1 and in the ground state the uh, electron will sit here but if the electron, uh, if the atom, I'm sorry, if the molecule is excited then if the molecule is in an excited state it is less bound and therefore the bond length will be larger so in the ground state I have a smaller bond length than in the excited state. The Frank Condon principle says that electronic transitions are very very fast and occur on time scales which are much less than the uh, vibrational frequencies. So therefore I can have a transition from the ground state into the excited state but not in the minimum of the excited state because I need to conserve that, uh, that distance so I'm going into a higher vibronic state so the, the, these uh, horizontal lines here are the uh, vibrational uh, bound states for this excited state and then I'm emitting phonons until I get to the bottom of the excited state and then here the recombination can take place but again the recombination must conserve the uh, position of the um, nuclei in this molecule and therefore I cannot recombine back down to the ground state but I need to combine into a higher vibronic level and then I can emit uh, phonons to get down to the ground state. So in the excited state the molecules are typically larger than in the ground state and because of this process that I'm, uh, I'm, I need to lose energy uh, by the emission of phonons both in the excited state after the initial excitation and in the ground state after the recombination because of that uh, there is a uh, usually a shift in the energies and the absorption peaks are typically at higher energies than the emission peaks and that just has to do with the different radii that, uh, of the molecules that participate in these transitions. So the first type of defect I want to talk about are color centers also known as F centers. So what is a color center? Uh, a color center is a vacancy and these color centers typically occur in um, alkali halides so alkali halides are um, insulators with large band gaps uh, from anywhere between 2 electron volts for sodium iodide to 5 electron volts for lithium fluoride so I have these large band gap insulators alkali halides and now I'm removing I am removing one of the anions and that leaves a positively charged site behind in the crystal and I can fill this positively charged site with an electron so I'm ripping out an anion and instead I'm putting electron I'm putting an electron there and uh, this is a type of defect which will absorb light and here I'm plotting the uh, energy of, these, uh, defect, of this defect absorption um, for various types of materials with various um, um, bond lengths so this is called a color center and it is, why is it called a color center? Um, materials like lithium fluoride or lithium chloride even sodium chloride what's the color of sodium chloride? 
It's white, right? It's white. You have it in your salt shaker. It's white. So sodium chloride is not exactly a colored crystal. But if you take the sodium chloride and put, uh, you remove one of the chlorine atoms and put an electron at that site, now if you have many of these defects, your crystal will have a color. And uh, therefore, uh, that's why these uh, defects are called color centers. Like I mentioned, uh, now, this is a relatively simple uh, color center. There are more complicated color centers. Um, I can have a defect where I have two vacancies, and I fill these two vacancies with one electron, so that is called an F2 plus defect. So it's an F2 because I have two vacancies and plus because it's positively charged because I have two vacancies but I only filled it with one electron. Uh, here I see the shift between the absorption and the emission. <laughs> and um, for such type of uh, uh, color centers here in uh, potassium fluoride, uh, the, emission length, the emission wavelength is typically in the infrared. So this is at 1.3 electron volts with different types of defects, different types of crystals uh, that can be shifted. Um, so we have an infrared emission wavelength and what we see is that the the width of this emission is very broad. Usually when we think of a laser then we have a very very sharp uh, transition like from a neodymium YAG laser that we'll talk about in a minute have very sharp lines. But these color centers have very broad emission lines and probably that has to do with uh, microscopic disorder that every one of these uh, defects looks a little bit different. And because these uh, lasers have very broad emission lines, uh, these color center lasers uh, can be uh, built so that they have uh, picosecond uh, pulse durations. So if I want to make an ultra short laser, then I need to have a broad emission length, uh, broad emission width. So uh, these color centers are, are very good, uh, color center lasers are have been, have seen many applications for, as infrared lasers. So the next uh, defect I want to talk about is neodymium in YAG. And um, before we do that, we need to uh, review uh, Hunt's rules and apply them to neodymium. So neodymium is a rare earth with a, uh, with a Z equals 60, so we have 60 electrons. And what do these uh, rules tell us? Well, the first rule is that we, we need to maximize the spin. So um, in the neodymium atom, this is the electron configuration. I have four electrons in the 4F shell, and I have two electrons in the um, 6S shell. So the 6S shell is full, so that doesn't do anything for us. And then, um, so it's clear how to, there's only one way to put two electrons into an S orbital. But how do we put these 4F electrons into the 4F shell? So the first rule is that we need to maximize the spin. So that's why all four of these spins are parallel and flipping just one of these spins costs a lot of energy and therefore we won't talk about that. The second rule is that we need to maximize the angular momentum. So um, this is a 4F electron. It has seven orbitals. Each of those can hold two spins. So that's why the F shell can hold 14 electrons. The angular momentum for an F shell is 3, so the ML can go from plus 3 to minus 3. If I want to maximize the L and all keep the spins parallel, 
then I can only do it like this. I cannot put all electrons here in the uh, shell with m equal 3 because that would violate uh, the Pauli principle. So I have to fill them up with the largest ml first and then uh, 2, plus, uh, 1 and 0. So what I'm getting is that the total L, I maximize the L is 3, 5, 6. So the total L is equal to 6. The total spin is equal to 2 because I have 4 electrons each with a spin of 1 half. And now we get to the third rule. If the shell is less than half full, like it is in this case, then the total angular momentum J, which is the sum of the angular momentum and the spin, that total angular momentum J for a shell that is less than half full is L minus S. So L minus S is 4. So using Hunt's rules, I can write down what the electronic configuration and what the angular momentum is for a neodymium atom. And um, the way that w one writes this is that I use L as the letter and then 2S plus 1 is a superscript on the left and J is a subscript on the right. And L equals 0 means S, L equal 1 means P, L equal 2 means 3, L equal 3 means F. L equals 6, I just keep counting letters, so L equals 6 becomes the letter I. In atomic physics we don't see this, so you know, only molecular physicists would see this. Um, so what about, um, what about a neodymium atom which has been ionized three times, because this is the type of defect that we would put into a, um, into a YAG crystal. So the, the neodymium 3 plus, so first we strip off these two 6s electrons and then we have to remove one of these uh, 4f electrons. So the electronic configuration for a neodymium 3 plus ion is 4f3, 6s0. So again we apply Hunt's rules, this time the spin is equal to 3 halves, L is still 6 because we've removed the one with ML equals 0, so that hasn't changed, and then the J is L minus S, so it's 6 minus 3 halves, so the J is equal to 9 halves. So that's the ground state for a neodymium 3 plus ion. What do the excited states look like? If I flip a spin, that costs a lot of energy, so we, don't want, we won't talk about those. So the third rule, can the, co the energy cost to violate the third rule is uh, relatively little, so we will see a lot of excited states where the J is not equal to 9 halves, but will actually be larger. Um, Violating the second of Hunt's rules is an intermediate energy cost. So for example, one type of excited state that I can look at is if I move the electron from the L equal 3 state to the L equal 0 state. In this case, the S is still 3 halves, but now the L is equal to 3, 2 plus 1 plus 0, so the L is equal to 3 and then uh, J is L minus S, that will be the ground state, so J equal 3 halves, uh, that would still be the ground state, yes, because the 3 is equal to 6 halves minus 3 halves, so J equal 3 halves would be the ground state of, of this uh, state. And now this state would be called uh, 4F 3 halves, because J is 3 halves, so that's the subscript, S is equal to 3 halves, so 4 is the superscript, and L equal to 3 becomes the letter F. So this is how we would apply Hunt's rules to a uh, threefold charged neodymium defect.
and we're going to put this defect into a YAG crystal. So what is YAG? YAG stands for Yttrium Aluminum Garnet and that is a crystal with this uh, chemical formula three yttrium atoms, five aluminum atoms and twelve oxygen atoms. So it's a very uh, complex crystal structure but it is an insulator and uh, that is what we need to know. So now we apply what we've learned about these uh, electronic states. So the ground state for this neodymium 3 plus ion is that 4i 9 halves and then there are excited states with different type of uh, total angular momentum J and then higher up we have this 4f3 half state which is that one and now if we place this if we place this uh, neodymium atom inside this insulating crystal then the interaction between this defect the interaction between this uh, metal ion defect in the insulator is relatively weak so the defect doesn't really talk to the host crystal and the uh, energies of this transition, the energies of this uh, rare earth ion don't depend much on the host crystal so in our consideration of the um, transitions within these defect states to first approximation we can ignore the uh, presence of the crystal and then we see that there are two types of transitions that can occur we can make a transition from 4 F3 halves to 4 I 11 halves and the uh, wavelength of this transition is 1.064 micrometer and then there's another transition with 1.32 microns the problem is that these transitions are forbidden because they have a total angular momentum change of 4 or 5 and we can only have uh, 1 uh, the, the delta J should be equal to 0 or 1 that was one of the selection rules that I had in one of uh, the earlier lectures so now we take into account that the um, ion is not an isolated ion but the ion is embedded in a crystal and therefore the F orbital needs to split in the crystal field and we can use the uh, group theoretical characters for the for F states uh, and we can calculate how they would split in, t uh, in a, a cubic crystal so we do we, we see indeed that there is a splitting uh, from the uh, from the crystal field but perhaps even more important is that uh, instead of being forbidden in an, in an isolated uh, ion uh, the crystal field also weakly allows these transitions with delta uh, with changes in total angular momentum of 4 or 5 so this picture shows the um, lines the emission lines of a neodymium defect in a uh, YAG crystal both at 77 Kelvin and at room temperature we see that there's a whole bunch of possible uh, transitions that can occur the most prominent one is this one with uh, 1064 nanometer wavelength and of course you recognize that wavelength because if I take such a neodymium YAG crystal uh, if I take such a YAG crystal with neodymium uh, ion impurities then I can build a YAG laser with a neodymium YAG laser with a uh, frequency of 1064 nanometers now instead of putting the neodymium into this YAG crystal I can also put the neodymium into this ILF crystal yttrium lithium fluoride and then the emission frequency is almost the same it's only shifted by 11 nanometers compared to the YAG crystal 
and um, the emission lines are relatively sharp it looks like they're relatively sharp but the bandwidth is still 120 gigahertz and therefore I can still make uh, lasers with an uh, with a, a pulse width of uh, on the order of picoseconds. So that was the first application for these defects um, that had to do with uh, rare earths. Now we can do the same with transition metals and we can go through the same uh, type of consideration using Hunt's rules and in this case uh, we put titanium into sapphire and then we get a similar type of uh, broad emission uh, here for the uh, titanium in sapphire we have this uh, significant shift between the absorption and the emission lines of this defect and the lines are extremely broad and therefore a Thai sapphire laser today is the uh, most popular laser for producing uh, femtosecond pulses because of this uh, broad bandwidth. So we can build lasers either with neodymium in YAG or with titanium in sapphire and um, the pumping of these lasers it used to be done with flash lamps and then later with um, uh, xenon lamps so that they could be run continuously nowadays uh, gallium arsenide diodes are much more efficient than a uh, xenon lamp and therefore the size of these lasers and the power consumption has gone down very significantly uh, what we can also do with a, a neodymium YAG laser is that we have a nonlinear crystal where two photons emitted from the neodymium YAG laser uh, will be uh, will merge into a single phone photon with uh, twice the energy or half the wavelength so that uh, process is known as a second harmonic generation so this laser can produce not only infrared light we can also use it uh, to produce green light another example is erbium and again we use uh, Hunt's rules to determine uh, the, the uh, ground state and then we have this um, wavelength, uh, emission wavelength on the order of 1.5 microns that's a very interesting technological wavelength and here the erbium is typically put as a dopant into an optical fiber and then one can pump this and one can get uh, light out of this optical fiber and, and so this would be an, an erbium uh, fiber laser um, in order to have fluorescent tubes for lighting purposes or to have uh, white light emitting diodes one needs phosphors and these phosphors are also defects transition metal defects like europium and terbium which are placed into different types of uh, oxides, garnets and these um, under UV excitation from a mercury gas for example uh, these uh, phosphors can convert the UV emission from the mercury gas lamp into uh, visible light and therefore these phosphors are uh, coated uh, on the inside of fluorescent tubes and what we can also do the same uh, to produce white LEDs in these white LEDs uh, we use uh, indium gallium nitrite an alloy to produce blue light and then we have two different phosphors uh, doped with europium which produce green and red light so the, together the combination of blue, green and red can uh, make white light and depending on the um, composition of that phosphor we can shift and change we can shift these peaks we can change their amplitudes and so we can change the color temperature and some of them are better for uh, different types of uh, illumination conditions.
So, so far I've talked about um, deep centers, uh, color centers and rare earth and transition metal ions in insulators. I want to talk a little bit about uh, shallow defects. And remember what we said about um, an exciton, that an exciton is a bound state which consists of an electron and a hole. Now in these shallow defects uh, the exciton is bound, so the electron is bound to a uh, donor or acceptor and then we can use the same uh, Bohr model solution to describe these, the energy states of these uh, shallow defects again we have this effective mass but now instead of being the reduced mass of the electron and the hole we either take the uh, electron mass for the uh, uh, donors energies and the um, hole mass for the acceptor energies and then we get a similar uh, 1 over n squared uh, series we get, a, we get a Rydberg series of all these um, emission uh, of all these emission and absorption lines for donors and acceptors and of course we also need to screen with the uh, static dielectric constant so all of this is very similar to the uh, exciton problem and then we can calculate what the binding energies uh, should be so here we look at a silicon donor in gallium arsenide and in gallium arsenide the binding energy that we calculate is about 5.7 milliEV so at room temperature this would be ionized and then the larger the band gap the larger the uh, excitonic binding energy and so this is what one calculates and in practice it is not that different so 5.72 is calculated for gallium arsenide and the experimental numbers are between 5.8 and 5.9 so within a few percent of what was calculated so the theory works very well however if we go to um, the valence band then in the valence band we have to worry about the warping we have to worry about uh, light holes and heavy holes and also if we go to other types of semiconductors indirect semiconductors like germanium silicon or gallium phosphide here we have anisotropic bands and therefore uh, the agreement of the theory with the experiments uh, in silicon and germanium is actually rather poor and therefore a number of corrections have to be made in order to properly calculate the donor and acceptor energies in silicon and germanium so now when we look at photoluminescence then this is the photon energy of the uh, emission in gallium nitride then we see we have these A and B excitons and these are the free excitons <coughs> those are the excitons that I talked about um, a few lectures ago but in addition to those free excitons which are combinations of electrons and holes we also see uh, excitons bound to a donor so that's an electron that's bound to a donor and that has a slightly different energy a lower energy actually and it has uh, very sharp peaks especially at very low temperatures so the dynamics of whether the donor recombination is more efficient or the uh, free exciton emission is more efficient that depends on uh, what exactly is the temperature and because we have so many different uh, donor and acceptor lines because of this 1 over n squared because we have so many different donor and acceptor lines if we measure the photoluminescence in uh, silicon which has been doped we see uh, many different lines related to the phosphorus donor and related to the uh, boron acceptor and these lines get even sharper 
if we use um, isotopically pure uh, silicon rather than natural silicon. And um, these donor lines have been uh, studied for many years using infrared spectroscopy. So this is rather well established and can be looked up. And I have a few slides at the end which have to do with stress and strain, but we're out of time, so I will skip that and you can look at this if you want to. So I wanted to conclude uh, this lecture series and it was very nice to be here. And um, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, we've looked at uh, vibrations in insulators. We looked at the uh, Drude model to describe the reflectance of metals and modified by interband transitions. We've looked at semiconductors. And in the last few uh, lectures, we looked at um, nanostructures and the optical properties of nanostructures and also defects. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And you have any last minute questions? And the sun is coming out. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> any questions? Well, I'm sorry I ran a little bit longer today, but uh, I, today I cannot say, oh, we'll continue next week. Thank you very much.